Hello class, this is section 5.3 and in this video we are going to discuss some of the properties of the sturm liouville problems. We are going to discuss a class of sturm liouville problems known as the regular sturm liouville problems. So we have this sturm liouville equation and we are going to impose certain boundary conditions. So we have uh, boundary conditions involving f and the derivative of f and we have the constants beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4, all real numbers. As you can see, this covers the Neumann, the Dirichlet, and the Robin boundary conditions we discussed in the previous video, if we pick the betas correctly. We are also going to insist that the p, q, and sigma are continuous functions on a, b, and that the continuity extends to the endpoints as well. The p, q, and sigma are real, and we also insist for the p and the sigma that they be positive everywhere, including at the endpoints a and b. When a sturm liouville problem obeys all these properties, we say that this is a regular problem. For regular problems like these, we know certain theorems about them that we can use to solve them, and you have seen some of these before already in our previous investigations on the heat equation, on the Laplacian, and the vibrating string equation too. The first of these theorems states that all the eigenvalues lambda are real. If you may recall, our goal in these boundary value problems is always to find lambda for which there is a non-zero solution f, and we have seen before in the past that all our eigenvalues are real. And this is true for all regular sturm liouville problems, in fact. Our second sturm liouville theorem is that they are infinitely many eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4. Um, these go on forever, up to infinity. And this is a property that we observed in our previous boundary value problem calculations. In fact, there is always a smallest eigenvalue, lambda 1, but never a largest eigenvalue since they go on to infinity. In most of our previous calculations, the smallest eigenvalue was either 0 or it was pi over L squared when we set n to equal 1. The third theorem states that there is an eigenfunction for every eigenvalue and that this eigenfunction is unique up to a constant multiple. And you have seen this before in our previous investigations. The eigenfunction was typically either a sine or cosine, and you could get other eigenfunctions by multiplying the sine or cosine by a constant. And secondly, each of those eigenfunctions has n minus 1 roots in the interval x between a and b. And this was true for our eigenfunction sine pi x over l. The fourth theorem relates to a property that mathematicians like to call completeness. We say that the functions f and x form a complete set, and this means that any piecewise smooth function on the interval a, b can be written down as a Fourier series of, this, of these eigenfunctions. In other words, you can write down fx as the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a constant times fn x all of these eigenfunctions. The fifth property is a property that mathematicians call orthogonality. We say that the eigenfunctions are orthogonal, and you will see this very familiar integral. If we integrate fm and fn x, and we multiply by sigma x, for m not equal to n, this integral will always give us zero. You may remember the sine and cosine integrals that we did in the beginning part of this course. And it turns out that these, this, these ideas work for all the regular sturm liouville problems. I might remind you that in our case, in the case of the heat equation, for example, our sigma x was equal to 1, so we just got a straight integral of the eigenfunctions in that setting. Now, all of the previous properties you have seen before, either in the context of the heat equation, the vibrating string equation, or the Laplace equation, this, I think, is something a little new. It's called the Rayleigh quotient, and it's a way to calculate the eigenvalue if you know what the eigenfunction is. 
This formula looks pretty terrible, but in practice, the calculation gets a lot easier once we include the information from the boundary values. We will discuss all of these theorems in a later part of the course.